Tonight we're beginning a series of messages which I have called the revelatory ministry of the miracles of Jesus. <clears throat> what that means is a lot of Jesus is made known mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in Christ's miracles. Yeah. Yeah. And I want to uh, discipline myself to zero in on that in these miracles and so there are indexes to God's character. Yes. By way of introduction, I want to set the tone for why Jesus performed miracles. He was not just a wonder worker, mm -hmm. something like a magician at a circus. <laughs> it wasn't like that. Jesus, he did what God wanted to have done. Yes. So when you see, when we read about his miracles, which are things he did that was what we call supernatural, that is, they couldn't be done if Jesus didn't do it. If God didn't do these, then we're impossible to do. That's what a miracle is. Right. Jesus spoke about this in John 4, 24. He said, My meat, or food, we would say, mm -hmm. is to do the will of Him that sent me and to finish His work. So Jesus was, uh, He was satisfied, just like a good meal nourishes you, doing God's will nourished Jesus and satisfied Him. Mm -hmm. He did for his soul what food does for your body. Mm -hmm. right. In John 6, 38, he said, I came down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. Now, that included his whole life. Mm -hmm. When he was a, a lad, and we don't know much about him, but he grew in wisdom and, and stature and favor with God and man, he was doing what God wanted. That, that's what God wants for a young person to do is to grow in wisdom and stature, a physical, your physical stature, and in favor with God and man. That's God's, That's what God wants done. Mm -hmm. And when he was in the temple at 12, <coughs> inquiring and asking questions and giving answers, that's what God wants. Mm -hmm. And when he worked miracles, that's what God wanted. Mm -hmm. Not just the working of the miracle, but the working of particular yeah. miracles. <coughs> Now, Jesus several times makes a statement about him doing the Father's works. He's being very careful to put the people in remembrance of this, mm -hmm. to make them God conscious. John 5.20 said, The Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself doeth or is doing. Mm -hmm. And he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. So when Jesus was working, God was showing Jesus as a man what he was doing. John 5, 36. I have greater witness than that of John, that's John the Baptist, for the works which the Father has given me to finish, the same works that I do, bear witness of me, that the Father sent me. Well, see, this is he said this a long time before he died. This included his death, but it was it was more, it was all the works he did. God was showing Jesus what he was doing. John 10, 27, I do not the work, if I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. So if God's not the one doing what I am doing, don't believe in me. Yeah. John 10, 38, but if I do, if I do, though ye believe not me, believe the works. <laughs> that ye may know and believe that the Father is in me, as is in me and I in him. So even if you... Uh, if what I say goes over your head, then look at what I'm doing. Yeah. And it'll teach you about the Father. Mm -hmm. That I and the Father was. It's quite a, quite a remarkable statement. In John 14, 11, believe that I'm in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very work's sake. So if, if you can't in your head figure out how God and Jesus are united, then look at what he did. Mm -hmm. And what he did will tell you that. So that's quite a remarkable thing to see. So this series of messages, this will be quite a few of them, is not just a study of miracles. I, I don't want it to degenerate into that an academic study. That's not what it is. May the Lord liberate us from academics. They're dry and they don't nourish. You'll notice that. This is a study of God's works. What are you doing? And there's more in these miracles than what occurred. <laughs> now we're going to view tonight Jesus' first miracle when he turned water into wine. I 
only a handful of people knew it. Hardly anybody knew he did this. And he didn't go out and say, tell him and announce that he did this. <laughs> Some people ever did and never did know he did this. Here's the accounts, John, second chapter, the first 11 verses. <coughs> the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, They have no wine. Jesus said unto her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. His mother saith unto the servants, Whatever he saith unto you, do it. And there were set there six water pots of stone, after the manner of the purifying of the Jews, containing two or three firkins apiece. That'd be twenty or thirty gallons apiece. Jesus saith unto them, Fill the water pots with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he saith unto them, Draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And they bear out. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the wine that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water knew, mm -hmm. The governor of the feast called the bridegroom. Saith unto him, Every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then that which is worse. But thou hast kept the good wine until now. This beginning of miracles did Jesus and Cain of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory. And his disciples believed in him. Now let's behold the context of this uh, wonderful miracle. The first, not bad for a first miracle. This was the first miracle. Yeah. Beginning of the beginning of miracles that Jesus did. <clears throat> well, there was a wedding feast in Cana of Galilee, and unlike people of lower cultures, they called Jesus and his disciples to the feast. Invited them to come. Now we're going to learn something here. And if you expect God to do something unusual, you're going to have to have Jesus and his disciples yeah. around. Uh -huh. This is how Jesus works. Yeah. <clears throat> There's no record, incidentally, of Jesus performing a work apart from his disciples. You might just be interested to check this out and see if it's not true. He didn't perform a private miracle for someone while the disciples were away. <laughs> They're always with him. Let's tell you, see, there's more involved in the people that enjoyed the miracle. There, there was more involved in that. He's doing this for his disciples. He wants them to see it. To behold his glory. Even when Jesus sent his disciples out, to perform miracles, he empowered them with the power that came from him. So they were, while they were performing these, they were acutely aware of the Lord Jesus himself. Showing here the context of miracles. See, some, some people, well, let me say this another way. Satan will try and convince people that God does wonderful things independently of his own personal interests. Mm -hmm. And of Jesus Christ himself and of his people. Well, I'm sorry, God doesn't operate like this. This is not God's manner. Yeah. And if it can't be done in the presence of his people, see if you can find somewhere where God did something supernatural where His somebody of his people wasn't there to behold it and to see it. So Jesus sent out his disciples, as I said, to you and he gave them power <coughs> against kind of an interesting way to say it power against <laughs> he gave them power against unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all manner of sickness and all manner of disease and they, they, when they went out they knew this <laughs> this was something that was 
from Jesus. It was supernatural. Again, on another occasion, Jesus saw a man, uh, the disciples of Jesus saw a man casting out demons, but this man wasn't traveling with them. And so it might appear as, though, ah, here's an exception to that rule. But when they told Jesus about it, Jesus said, don't forbid him. But they asked him, for up, oh, you're not a member of our church. Yeah, it's, it's got to kind of put it in modern language. We're the first church. We're the ones that's working with Jesus. You stop, <coughs> stop doing that. Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can speak lightly of me. And then he adds, He that's not against me is, he's with me. He's with us. So see, he was, he was part of Jesus' band also. It was just unknown to everybody else. Do not expect truly great works without Jesus and his disciples. If, they, if such a thing does happen, it will be very, very unusual. In fact, I would be highly suspicious of any purported supernatural work that, that where Jesus was not very prominent and his disciples or his followers were not present. I would be, I'd have to weigh that a little more carefully. Secondly, note this about this miracle. It was set within the context of need. Some see, see Jesus never did anything just to be seen or to entertain or just to be a spectacle. You know, Herod wanted him to do that. When Jesus yeah. appeared before Herod, he said, Oh, Herod said, I hope he'll do some miracle for me. See, but this isn't how, this isn't how Jesus operates. The context was they ran out of wine. And Mary did know who to go to, didn't she? Yeah. And she, she didn't tell him anything new. She just said, they have no wine. That's all you, if she, you don't have to spill everything out all the time to Jesus. You just kind of say what the case is. Mm -hmm. One time a man came to Jesus and said, my servant is sick. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he just told him the case. See, a, a simplistic theology would tell you, well, God knows everything already anyway. He understands our situation, but he wants us to tell him what our situation is. They have no wine. Mm -hmm. God is not prone to work where there are other solutions. Now, here's another important thing to see. Mm -hmm. I do not know that it is ever proper mm -hmm. to ask God to supernaturally do for you what somebody else could do. Yeah. I don't. I think mm -hmm. we'll have a hard time supporting it that 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 is a proper view of things. <clears throat> for instance. There's something about need that can provoke people Godward. Mm -hmm. This is seen in the Psalms and in the prophets. Psalm 86, 16 says, Fill their faces with shame, that they may seek thy name, O Lord. Oh, a little index to God. <laughs> a little index. Maybe, maybe something like a tsunami wave. Uh -huh provokes people to seek the Lord. Maybe, maybe it takes something like that to show people how quickly they run out of resources. Uh -huh. yes. God works within the context of need. Isaiah 26, 9. These are little snapshots of God's character. With my soul have I desired thee in the night. Yea, my spirit within me will I seek, with my spirit within me will I seek thee early. For when thy judgments are in the <laughs> earth, the inhabitants of the world will learn righteousness. Ooh. That is to say they become more God conscious. Why? Because their own resources run out. They have no wine. See, Jesus didn't come into the picture until they ran out. Then he come into the picture. <clears throat> you ponder a lot of the hopelessness that attended the miracles that Christ worked blind people from birth. Who's anyone, who is anyone else going to do for these, these people? People that were deaf, people that were dumb, couldn't speak, people that were impotent, paralytics, lepers, a woman with an issue of blood for 12 years, dead being raised, you know, all kind of miracles. You trace through it, you see that, it, that that end had come to human resources yeah. when Jesus came into the picture. This is Christ's manner. <coughs> 
And it's also, this miracle is not only said in the context of Jesus and his disciples being there and human resources running out, it's also within the context of God's timetable. Jesus is very acutely aware of God's timetable. He said, when Mary said, they, they're out of wine, run out. He said, woman, what have I to do with thee? Well, roughly translated, that means, I really don't need this information uh, from you. I understand this. I don't operate because there's need. That's not what moves me into action. He says, my time, mine hour is not yet come. He said, I'm operate by another agenda. How much time passed between uh, when Mary said that and when Jesus acted? I don't know. It was, it was a, the same feast and the same day. We know that. But Jesus was driven by his Father's agenda. A little later in John 7, verse 6, Jesus said unto them, My time is not yet come. He wanted people to know this. That Jesus just doesn't operate at the whim of everybody. And I've got to be very careful in dealing with this. Because I must all at the same time, I must avoid the conclusion that God will not hear a person on the... Uh, on, that it, he just... it's not time to do it. I've got to avoid that kind of conclusion too. Right. But you... I'm, I have every confidence in God that if you will walk with God, He will put your desire in sync with His timetable. Yeah. That's what, you, that's what you've got to see. John 7.30 They sought to take him, Jesus, but no man laid hands on him because his hour was not yet come. John 8.20 These words spake Jesus in the treasury and he taught in the synagogue and no man laid hands on him for his hour was not yet come. I'm showing you here that this beginning of miracles wasn't because that was the first crisis that had occurred since Jesus came into the world. This was the Father's timetable to start this aspect of Christ's ministry. John 12, 23, now the hour had come when he was going to be delivered up, and this is why he let his guard down, so to speak, among people. Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come, that the Son of Man should be glorified. So there was a, an abrupt cessation of miracles. They just abruptly stopped. Yeah. That was it. He unplugged from teaching the multitudes. It just abruptly stopped. That was it. Mm -hmm. It wouldn't have made any difference if a multitude had came to him and asked him to teach. It just stopped. Mm -hmm. Because the time came for him to lay down his life. Mm -hmm. An offering for many. John 13, 1. He said, "By Now therefore... The feast of the Passover, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of the world unto the Father, having loved his own which were in the world, he loved them unto the end. That is to say, when the hour came for him to leave, no more multitudes, no more synagogue discourses, no more teaching in the temple. I'm going to eliminate all that and spend my hours with my disciples. See, none of us know when our hour to depart is going to come. Mm -hmm. But I can tell you, if my, when my hour to depart comes, I don't want to be down at the theater yeah. or with some carnal people. Mm -hmm. Jesus didn't, and I don't want to be either. The hour has come. Now I want to correlate this a little bit with a word Solomon said. <laughs> This is a high end now of what Solomon said about time. It's found in the book of Ecclesiastes, the third chapter. In the first few verses, here's what he said. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill, a time to heal. You don't want to miss that. <laughs> a time to break down, a time to build up. 
A time to weep, a time to laugh, a time to mourn, a time to dance. <laughs> a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. A time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rent and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. And blessed is the person who can distinguish, <laughs> who can distinguish those times. Well, Jesus could. He could distinguish them. So in our consideration of the working of the Lord, we ought to throw this into the scenario. So we want to be, it isn't that you just sit back, pardon, pardon me for uh, explaining in this way, but it isn't that we just sit back and wait for the time. Mm -hmm. That is it. We press in so we will know the time. Mm -hmm. That's the point. In fact, this is categorically what the scripture says in Romans 13, 11, knowing the time. That now it is high time to wake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we first believed. One of the prophets, he observed how iniquity is spreading, and he said, It is time for you to work. He sensed it. See, that's what, uh, that's what we want to be able to do. In fact, we have recently experienced something like this. When, uh, whether you thought of it in this, in th this way or not, this is what actually happened moved in close to the throne and the God God showed us the time mm -hmm. and brought us into the work. Yeah. That, that's what actually happened. And as you know, when the time when God's time comes, <laughs> what God has determined happens. Mm -hmm. No question about it. <laughs> now let's look into it a little this a little more. I'm still talking about the context of God, of Christ's miracles. What what kind of framework did he work in? He worked in the framework of, the, of his presence and the disciples' presence within the context of need, perceived need. Perhaps I should say that. He worked within the context of perceived need when everything ran out. He sat within the context of God's timetable. And he worked within the context of perception. Not his perception, the perception of the people round about. Now Mary had some perception. She said to the servants, Whatsoever he saith unto you, do it. Mm -hmm. See, she knew, I'm reading between the lines here, she knew that Jesus wasn't going to do anything until it was time, but when he did it, shape up and listen up. Mm -hmm. Something's about to happen, so whatever he says. If he says, go home, go home. Mm -hmm. If he says to do something else, do it. Whatever he says, yeah. do it. It is possible for the human spirit to be so sensitive to God that they know when it's the time. Mm -hmm. Amen. And if God, if Jesus is speaking from heaven, mm -hmm. and Hebrews 12, 25 says he is, if they refused, if they uh, suffered who didn't hear him who spoke from heaven, see that you do not refuse him who is speaking from heaven. Mm -hmm. He is right now speaking from heaven. Mm -hmm. And we can be tuned in to it. <clears throat> John 11:22. Here's the man uh, at whose faith Jesus marveled. He was per he perceived the situation. He said to Jesus, "I know that even now, whatsoever thou wilt ask of God, God will give it thee." I know that. That's perception. Mm -hmm. And you can know this theologically, like I know the Bible says, and and <laughs> the Lord free us from that kind of that kind of approach. This is not the kind of knowledge He's talking about. He's talking about the knowledge of faith here. This person was convinced of this. If I can, if Jesus will just ask God about this, it'll be done. I know this is the case. See, mm -hmm. blessed day when that dawns upon the soul. Blessed day. So it's within the context of perception. Think of this statement that Paul said about himself. For the cause, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I'm not ashamed. For I know whom I believed, I know whom I believed, mm -hmm. and am persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. I know him, I know him, and I will tell you that whatever a person's 
theological view may be of miracles, and there are, as you know, a variety of them. And some people have find it very difficult to believe that God does work miracles. Mm -hmm. They're in their theology says He did. I don't know really that they're really convinced about that either. That's a matter of opinion, but yeah. <clears throat> but Paul said, I know, <laughs> I know whom I believe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. When you know that it's not a question about whether he can. It's not a question about whether he's not concerned. Right. It's not a question about what he, what, whether there, if human resources run out, what can be done. That's not the question at all. And there are times when you can uh, ask in faith, and blessed is the person who does, and seeks to live in that kind of a consciousness. Now let's look further at this, at this miracle. There's a, it was done within the framework of proper containers proper containers. <laughs> Jesus was not like Belshazzar. Right. And that when Belshazzar, he was drinking wine also. And Daniel, the fifth chapter, verse 3, said he drank out of golden vessels that were in the house of God. Mm -hmm. Cost him his life that day. That yeah. day he died, and that day the Medes took over the kingdom. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But Jesus, he noticed that there was some... Uh, Pots of stone. Huh, kind of an appropriate picture. <coughs> Pots of stone there, six of them. And they were used for the, they weren't pots for drinking, they were pots for washing. How's that? The scripture tells us that the law consisted of diverse washings. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 9.10 And they, this was ceremonial. There was, this was ceremonial cleansing. John 3.35 said there arose a question between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purifying. So they had certain ceremonies they, they went through. Mark 7.2 the disciples were criticized because they ate with unwashed hands. Now he wasn't talking about hygiene here. The fourth verse says when they came from the market, except they wash, they eat not, and many other things there be that which they have received to hold as the washing of cups and pots and brazen vessels and of tables. is of ceremonial washings. And that's what these pots, <laughs> these six pots made of stone. <coughs> so there wasn't anything in the pots that could do this. Right. Huh? These are just stones fitly portraying our human nature. And there were six of them, about uh, two to three firkins apiece, that's 20 to 30 gallons. So we're talking about 120 to 180 gallons. And what 120 to 180 gallons of good wine would cost. Kind of a thought. See, we shouldn't expect small things from God. He didn't say, bring a glass. Fill up a glass. You know that some people receive very little from God because they don't have something big enough. Yeah. They just ask for a glass or a cup or a thimble. It's good to bring a flag on. Yeah. Instead of a little tall, small jar. But don't expect small things. The scripture tells us <coughs> that he is able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or think. To bring that into the scenario when you ask God to do something. It's easy, I would suspect, for some people to ask God to give them a good day. Yeah. There's nothing, nothing wrong with that, particularly. It's just that it's a little low for what God's able to do. Mm -hmm. Lord, ask God for everything to work out of the job today. Well, as we do, we do ask God to do that. Lead us out of temptation, deliver us from evil. This is what we do. But we don't want to end here. Yes, sir. This isn't the top end of the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Take something big. Six, seek, six, seek for six pots. Not just one or two or three. Remember that time Elisha told the king, <coughs> said, um, <coughs> take your bow, shoot an arrow, hit the ground with that arrow. Pulled it back and shot an arrow into the ground. We were like up on a high elevated place. 
He said, no, nah. he said, just at a venture, take your arrows and start shooting and hit the ground. He shot three times and stopped. And Elisha got him, oh, he got upset with him. He said, you should have shot five or six times. See how foolish this would sound foolish to <laughs> people in the flesh. This sounds foolish. So what's the big deal shooting arrows in the ground? What? What's that so, such an insignificant thing? Well, he says, now you're just going to smite the Assyrians three or, about three times. That's going to be it. And, and then you won't be able to overcome them. See, some people never get very far because they never extend themselves very much. They never get six pots out there to be filled. Mm -hmm. Just always small. And showing now the context of miracles. I'm not sure that Jesus works miracles in a casual, haphazard, uninvolved environment. This is not his manner. And while some people look at the obvious lack of signs and wonders in our day, and they conclude it's because he doesn't work like this anymore. Yeah. Even though there's not the slightest indication in Scripture, this is true. But it could very well be that this isn't the kind of environment he works in. Could be that too. Well, this was the environment he did work in. Now, after a, Jesus didn't tell these servants what was going to happen, he just said, "Fill them up." And of course, when when Jesus says, "Fill them up," that's what he means. So they filled them up to the brim, right up there. Now, if the Lord. Uh, if you read about the Lord filling us with all joy and peace and believing, it's up to the brim. Mm -hmm. Those who say think they get a thimble full of grace, I'm sorry, that isn't how it comes. It's to the brim. Amen. That's that's what that's the context he works in, is the to the brim mm -hmm. context. Now after they had filled them up, you have to you have to give the water to the right people. They just didn't say, start passing it out to the people. <clears throat> oh no. <laughs> this is the way he works. He said, draw it out and bear to the governor of the feast. That's the one in charge. Take it to the official one so he can uh, sort of announce what's happened. Yes. That's his manner. And <laughs> so they did. He they did. They drew it out to the governor of the feast. When the ruler of the feast had tasted the water, that was made wine. It's a, up to this point, it was, it was water. Up to this point. Something happened between <coughs> drawing it out and giving it out. Something happened. Uh -huh. And he had tasted the water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but <laughs> the servants withdrew the water. They knew. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They knew what? The water turned to wine? What he says, they knew where this come from. Yep. Mm -hmm. They knew what they put in there. Mm -hmm. What they put in there was water. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But the benefit of it was wine. Mm -hmm. Oh, let's translate it into let's translate it into what happens among God's people. What we put into it is the water of prayer. But what comes out mm -hmm. is a wonder and a sign. Amen. Huh? Something ordinary, like a supplication. But well, what happens is, is it another supplication. What happens is some divine resolution. He tasted it. And he had to taste it, see. You have to taste it. I get the picture that it may even look like water. I don't know. I don't, you say, oh, how, why didn't he recognize this by odor or sight? He, he had to taste it. Yeah. You can theorize about did God do it, did God not do it, but you got to taste it. Mm -hmm. you got to taste and see that the Lord is good. See? Otherwise, just talk about it. This isn't going to do it. Have to taste it. And he did. <laughs> it's a depiction that illumination follows drinking. Mm -hmm. yeah. You want your eyes to be opened? To put, put it vulgarly, you got to get your nose in your Bible. And activate your mind to meditate on these things before something's going to happen. Now you ponder the same times that you ponder the times that something such as we re recounted this last Friday. There was a lot of tasting that preceded that. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of a lot of drinking, so to speak, mm -hmm. musing and meditating. Offering supplications and prayers before we were able to see 
what really what happened there. The procedure violated ordinary protocol. The ordinary protocol <coughs> would have been just to start passing the pass they. He didn't say the governor of the feast ran out of wine. He says they have no wine. See? But he, he violated the normal protocol and he gave it to someone who could be able to tell. Uh -huh. This happened to someone that could be able to tell. Now there have been some miracles that Jesus wrought that the people themselves weren't informed people, but, it's, but they were able to perceive what had happened, such as the blind man. He said, I don't know whether this man is from God or not, but I do know this, that I was blind and now I see. Amen. And so this is what happened here. This, this governor of the feast, whatever they might have speculated about this, he could tell this, I tasted the other wine and now I'm tasting this wine and I can tell you this is the best right here. This is the best. Mm -hmm. hmm has to be someone who knows. The wisdom of the world, see, is contrary to the wisdom of God. Mm -hmm. Also, you see this principle in God's workings, that wherever God works, things get better. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's when they get better. You save the best, not till the last. The, the last is the best, not the worst. Mm -hmm. See, in the world, the worst part of, of flesh is the last. <laughs> it deteriorates. Mm -hmm. It goes down. But as the Lord, it's the best. Now let's get more into this even more. <clears throat> the results. That's what, this is why God works, is results. Mm -hmm. What results from this? The first, it says that he manifested forth his glory. Hmm. Now his glory, what is this glory? The glory is what's revealed of Christ. He, in this, he showed something about himself. In this. This is the beginning of miracles, did Jesus in Cain of Galilee, and manifested forth his glory. What kind of glory did you see there? Well, you found that he does put a treasure in earthen vessels. Here's, a, here's an example. Right in our text. You find that he takes the ordinary and makes it extraordinary. See, that's, that's something else you learn from God. He can take the mundane, everyday experiences of life and transform them into wine. Yeah. So they actually become invigorating and bless the soul. So that let's just say, for instance, your job or your daily routine, whatever you do. In a sense, it's like ordinary water. You just do it every day, do it every day. But see, whether you're a student or a, a wife diligently about the home obligations and duties, or a man earning his living, or whatever, it's like water, but fill it up to the brim, mm -hmm. and Jesus can turn it into satisfying wine. Amen. So that it refreshes the heart and makes the face shine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it makes the heart glad. This is see, this is what God does. He takes the ordinary, like he he takes Moses' rod, and when he got through, it was not just a rod. And he takes the jawbone and he puts it in the hands of Samson and it turns into a fierce weapon. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that it what would happen if you opened a weapon store of jawbones. You think anybody mm -hmm. would buy this? Yeah. Or you say, you open a store of rods. Mm -hmm. Come and buy your rod and hold your rod over water and see if it'll, mm -hmm. if it'll part. Or touch, <laughs> touch the waters, even turn to blood. Or what, see, the, the, he took Moses' rod mm -hmm. and he took the sand, jawbone of an ass in Samson's hand. Or, or what about a David sling? Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, he took something ordinary and made yeah. it extraordinary. That's, that's my point I'm making here. That in miracles, one aspect of a miracle, he will take something ordinary and makes it make it extraordinary by his own power and glory. Or you take the widow's little jar of oil. It was ordinary, but when she started pouring, she filled the whole house full of jars, and that oil became extraordinary. Or a woman with a little bit of meal and a little bit of oil about to make her last cakes and died, but. She used it and filled it to the brim, so to speak, and it converted to extraordinary. So one of 
one of the things about the Lord's working is turning things that are ordinary into extraordinary. Or a little boy's lunch. Mm -hmm. uh, five loaves and two fishes. That's the miracle. See, it takes a miracle to take something ordinary and make it extraordinary. That's mm -hmm. what I'm saying. So that some of us have actually been acquainted with the extraordinary workings of the Lord, but because it was associated with the ordinary or normalities of life, perhaps you didn't think of it this way. Perhaps the fact that you have been able to work singing the songs of Zion and rejoicing in your heart, perhaps you have associated that with something normal. It's not something normal. Uh -huh. this, is some, this is the working of God. Amen. It's just as great as turning water into wine. Amen. Or a jawbone of an ass into a weapon, or a rod into something that parts a sea, or a sling into, into slaying the Goliath. He took something ordinary. He made it extraordinary. So what I'm saying is, if you walk with God, you're living with the extraordinary. Now connect that with your prayers. Amen. Mm -hmm. You're familiar with the extraordinary already. Mm -hmm. Connect it with prayers. And something else you learn the servants knew. If you're involved... You know. Now, yeah. now I can tell you up front, we've already experienced some of this, that as you relate what just happened with Sister Sadie, you relate, there's going to be people that are going to say, well, but you know, maybe yeah. maybe the doctors were wrong. Yeah. See? But the servants, mm -hmm. the ones that did the praying, they know. <laughs> they know. I will tell it far and wide, but every time, the servants will know. Yeah. Yeah. Praise God for that. That's a token. This is a token. This is like wages. Yes. It's like wages. You involve yourself in the good work of God, and you're one of the first ones that reaps the benefits. The servants that drew it out, they knew. And, of course, here's what the Psalms, the Scriptures tell us this. Psalm 25, 14, the secret of the, the, secret of the Lord. Is yes, with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. Well, here, Jesus showed mm -hmm. his great power. And Jesus said to his disciples, Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known to you. That's what Jesus did at this first beginning of miracles. He was doing the works of God. He knew what was God, what God was going to do. He knew God's time, but he showed it to his disciples. You've got to make that connection. He showed it to his disciples. And they, they believed on him after that. Well, you notice the abundance involved here. 100, 180 gallons of wine. I don't know how many people were at the wedding feast, but that probably was a fairly good supply. Might have been a little bonus. I don't know. It was a, quite a bit. But you've got to get used to this, that God sent Jesus to give up an abundance. Amen. To give an abundance. Jesus didn't deal with little cups and saucers. That's not what he dealt with. But sometimes if you're not careful, a Babylonian religion will teach you to like think of little bitty things when you think of God. You'll think of little bitty things. Don't do that. Think of an abundance. Jesus came to have that we might have life and have it more abundantly. I fully expect the uh, condition of Sister Sadie to end up infinitely more than it was at its very best state before. Mm -hmm. This is the manner in which Jesus works. I have no doubt but the blind people he healed and so forth had very they, they excelled ordinary people. Yeah. Their vision is probably better than a normal person's vision after that. This is the manner in which he works. Now let's look at something else here. <laughs> the best is last. So that's pretty good for people that are going, headed toward the grave. <laughs> that's a pretty good piece of news. Yeah. That things are getting better mm -hmm. as we go along. 1 Corinthians 15.46 says that was not first which is spiritual. Mm -hmm. It wasn't first. Right. That which is natural and afterward mm -hmm. that which is spiritual. See, that's, that's kind of the manner of the kingdom. So these things are made known in this miracle. And here, here's a wonderful result. His disciples believed on him. Mm -hmm. Now, this wasn't the first time they believed on him. 
understand, this wasn't the first. So I'm going to read you a little section of scripture here that took place before this miracle. Several people are involved here. This begins in John, the first chapter, verse 41. Starts with uh, Andrew, who found his own brother Simon, and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. And when Jesus beheld him, he said, Thou art Simon, the son of Jonah. Thou shalt be called Cephas, which is by interpretation a stone. I'm underscoring this happened before this miracle. The day following, Jesus would go forth into Galilee and findeth Philip, and saith unto him, Follow me. Now Philip was of Bethsaida, the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip finds Nathanael, and says to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and in the prophets did write, Jesus of Nazareth. And notice how imperfect his understanding was. The son of Joseph. Uh -huh. He was technically wrong there. Uh -huh. And Nathanael said unto him, Can there be any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said unto him, Come and see. <laughs> Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and saith unto him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom is no guile. Nathanael said, Whence knowest thou me? Some people would have said, Who, me? <laughs> John Nathanael. He really was this kind of person. Jesus answered and said unto him, Before that Philip called thee, when thou wast under the fig tree, I saw thee. Nathaniel answered and said unto him, Rabbi, thou art the Son of God, thou art the King of Israel. Sounds like an expression of faith to me. Jesus answered and said unto him, Because I said unto thee, I saw thee under the fig tree, believest thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. He said unto him, Verily I say unto you, Hereafter ye shall see heaven open, and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Now my point in reading this is, see, these people they had believed. His disciples had technically believed. But now you're going to get a little insight into the nature of faith. There was a point when you first believed. But believing didn't end there, and it didn't reach its peak there either. Our text says after this miracle, his disciples believed it picked up a notch. Their believing come up a notch. Yeah. And it had best do so in our case, too. Yeah. Yeah. It had marked us. Well, if there are any among us that take this report that we uh, gave praise to God for about Friday for granted, and their faith doesn't pick up, they're going to get worse. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I hope this doesn't happen, but I'm telling you that is what will happen. Yeah. It is what will happen. If your faith doesn't pick up, there is no fire. So far as that person is concerned, there is no purpose served mm -hmm. by the miracle. Mm -hmm. None whatsoever. Confirms John's statement. He said in the last of his gospel, these things are written that you might believe. Mm -hmm. Well, they already believed. He was writing to believers. Mm -hmm. These things are written that you might believe, and that believing you might have life through his name. So believing is something that increases as seen in this uh, very text. <clears throat> it also confirms that believing requires alertness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Could you imagine maybe the disciples off to the side talking with some of the people? If, they, if this had been some of the groups I've been in in my lifetime, the disciples would have been off on the side talking about the Super Bowl or something. Yeah. <laughs> Let me tell you, brothers and sisters, in every gathering of the saints where Jesus is with his disciples which was the case, that was the occasion we just read about in this miracle there are things going on in such an assembly all the time where two or three are gathered in Jesus name he's there among them not as a spectator but he's working moving in but if you're not alert it just passes right by you and it just looks like an ordinary meeting. Maybe we sang a little extra loud. Or, that's how it will be viewed. Mm -hmm. But if you're alert, your faith will come up mm -hmm. a few notches. But frequently, God works in a, in a manner that will promote faith, but the distracted minds do not get the message. <laughs> do not get the message. So sometimes we will say things about being alert and being sensitive because we we've, we understand the weakness of the flesh. But you had to subdue your flesh. Yeah. 
you have to bring it into subjection. And if your body is weary, well, you got to wake it up. Whatever means you use, you got to do it. Amen. Because there may be some water turned into wine that night, and you miss out on it. So there's his first miracle. I tried to view it in a little different way. That uh, Jesus is showing that he works within the context of his presence with his disciples. So you have every right to expect something to happen of some sort when Jesus and his disciples are together. Something's going to, some insight, some work, something's going to happen. He works in the context of need when you become aware of the poverty of your flesh, the poverty of your own mind, the poverty of your own strength when it, when it comes across to you. That's the context he works in. He works in the context of God's time. You want God's timetable to be something that does involve doing something with you. Yeah. And he works in the context of perception. The servants knew, see? And... Uh, he works in abundance among his people. This is the beginning of miracles of our Lord Jesus.